Uh, Logan, uh, this is uh, the program on constitutional government, and our speaker today is Todd Lindbergh, uh, who's going to talk on the politics of heroism. Todd Lindbergh is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, uh, not in Palo Alto, but in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's um, written, uh, written a book bef um, before the one that he's going to discuss today, called the, um, and a fine book, called The Political Teachings of Jesus. And his most recent book that, he's, that he will discuss is The Heroic Heart, Greatness, Ancient and Modern. He's a graduate of the University of Chicago in 1982. So, Todd Lindbergh. Thanks very much, Harvey, and uh, thanks all of you for coming. The question that I began to investigate in this book uh, is really quite simply stated. Uh, it, heroism entails some kind of generally accepted claim to some kind of uh, superiority. Uh, we live in, we who are fortunate enough to live in the modern world, that is to say, live in a very egalitarian, democratic society. Equality is our passion. What, then, is the type of superiority, uh, if any, that is compatible with this overarching uh, passion for equality, for egalitarianism? And uh, I do think there's an answer to that question. I'm not going to hold you in suspense at great length on the subject. Uh, but clearly, it's not Achilles. Uh, we don't really have space in this world, this modern world, for the slaying, conquering, uh, great warrior hero of old who was in it primarily either for his own glory or for the advancement of his own sense of self and his own ambition. We do have good warriors. That's a different question, I think. But it's not the same type. Uh, so that's not it. But I think we do have a type. And uh, I think the exemplary character is the 9-11 firefighter, an almost consensus uh, level uh, uh, of uh, agreement among Americans would attach heroism to the status of people who are willing to run into the World Trade Center um, when I think the natural impulse for any human being would be to run away from it. Uh, and that is uh, something that we do indeed highly value. So what, and what is that really? Well, I think it's a kind of, a, in a way, an ultimate form of uh, egalitarianism, not even really to privilege your own life uh, over that of the stranger in the burning building whom you are rushing uh, in in order to try to save. That's, uh, that's equality. That is uh, sacrifice. That is a willingness to put it all on the line. That is a willingness to risk a death. Uh, again, looking a little bit at uh, the warrior experience in America these days, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's just uh, look at some of the uh, uh, Congressional Medal of Honor winners. The citations go back to the Civil War. Uh, in the course of doing the book, I did a, uh, a, a, quant a qualitative analysis uh, of, uh, of all those citations going back to the Civil War with the help of some researchers. And we classified uh, the citations on the basis of the extent to which the conduct described in the citations contained a life-saving function. Um, now, many uh, citations uh, have always had this uh, this life-saving element to it, and that would be the guys who had whatever it requires to dive on a grenade and take the blast in order to save the people around them. So that citation is not an unfamiliar one going back even to the oldest history of the, uh, uh, really, the, the citations don't get descriptive until around the First World War. Um, but there were other types of citations, and I'm, for purposes of uh, simplicity, I'm going to call them the Sergeant Fury kinds of citations, where you know the guy charges up the hill uh, and into the advent, into the machine gun fire uh, coming out of the German pillbox and uh, engages in a hand grenade duel, kills the people inside, is wounded, uh, advances farther up the hill to the next pillbox. I'm just insanely. Um, uh, well, I mean, you know, the Greeks had a word for it, Aristea. It's the greatness of the of the warrior in full th throes of uh, uh, of fighting, and uh, and I think that you know that's uh, that's very much. Uh, uh, an indication that, that there's still an element of that in, in the world today. 
But two things. One uh, is that uh, we don't see those types of citations anymore in Congressional Medal of Honor citations. All the citations, really, uh, especially since um, uh, the end of the Vietnam War, uh, have had a very prominent uh, life-saving component uh, in involved in them. So in other words, uh, it would be about uh, a guy who exposed himself to enemy fire and possibly was uh, even killed in the course of it in order to try to rescue a fallen comrade who was on the ground. Um, or, uh, uh, you know, again, we, you know, the, the, the grenades are, are still part of the story. Um, now, you could say, uh, and I think it's quite possible that, there's an, uh, the, that the citations from the old days and the conduct described in them is not necessarily all that different from the conduct that is being described in more recent times in these citations. Uh, because it's quite possible, I think, in re that you could that you could redescribe some of the older citations uh, in these life-saving terms. Uh, but I think it's instructive that, that we, they were not so described then, and they are so described now. Uh, they uh, uh, the the emphasis is very emphatically placed upon this uh, uh, this this life-saving element, uh, and it's I think almost. Um, inconceivable nowadays that, that there would be a Congressional Medal of Honor, which is, our, of course, our, the highest military award, that did not have this life-saving component included in it. Um, so what does it say that the, the, the military uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the big liberal superpower in the world uh, also takes as its touchstone for the highest conduct that it wishes to recognize this life-saving component uh, as well? And then let's look to a more controversial character, Chris Kyle, American sniper. Um, now, uh, there, there were those, for example, Michael Moore, who uh, took to Facebook, I think, to, to criticize the, the activity of the sniper as being something that was uh, traditionally uh, suspect. I mean, it's, it's an attack from a far distance, uh, un unfair, catching someone unaware. It's not really, not really fair fight type combat. Uh, but, you know, when you ask Kyle, uh, as people did, you know, what he, what he was doing, why, why he was doing what he was doing. He said, well, I'm, I'm doing this to save lives. I'm saving the lives of my comrades, my uh, people, people in arms, uh, uh, Americans, as well as uh, coalition partners in, uh, uh, in, in, in Afghanistan. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think you have to take that seriously when you, when you listen to what he says. And, and I think people did. And so there was that, uh, that was, there was that heroic uh, element that emerged. Now, you know, this is a, uh, a, a politics of, of heroism in which um, heroism is compatible uh, in a way and not so much a threat uh, to democratic order. We'll talk about threats to democratic order um, and, uh, in, in a little bit. But I do want to contrast this type of heroic activity, this egalitarian form of heroism, this willingness to risk it all, but in order to save the lives of others uh, with the kind that is more familiar uh, from the ancient world, the, uh, uh, the Achilles style uh, heroism, uh, which I think is very much motivated from this uh, sense of uh, in its, in its highest form uh, of, of superiority with, within. Uh, Achilles uh, thinks he is better uh, than others, all of us. He's the greatest warrior, everyone says so. Um, and uh, he's uh, uh, willing to prove it, uh, but not in order for you to regard it as proved, but actually as just as a simple physical act of demonstration of his greatness. And, um, but you know, there's a problem here as we know from the Iliad. And that's that um, uh, it's up to the hero to decide whether he's going to be uh, participating in the activity you have him signed up for, namely uh, the Trojan War, or whether he's going to go sulk in his tent because of a slight that he believes he has suffered at the hands of hmm, the greatest king, the lord of men, Agamemnon. So, this is a. This is a. In my, I've, I've, ca I've called this a kind of inner-directed heroism. Uh, it beginning with a kind of sense of greatness. I admit, I'm uh, freely that I'm importing a modern term to describe this, but I, but I think it, it begins with a sense of self as superior, 
uh, if there is an appetite for glory that arises from this sense of self uh, as superior, as sometimes there is, um, it is an appetite for glory that begins in superiority uh, and, and which glory is a subsidiary uh, quality. It's not per se glory. Everybody might want a little bit of that, but it's, it's what's due. It's due because of superiority. Um, and I think that uh, that's, uh, that's the Achillean uh, character. Now, so what we know from this, first of all, uh, in the, the political problem is this. Um, we have the greatest king and the greatest warrior as two distinct individuals. They are not united. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a big problem. Um, there's a clash. Uh, Achilles is Agamemnon's biggest problem, and May, as a result of his decision to go brood in his tent rather than join the fight, uh, May uh, cost the Greeks the war. Uh, and uh, if you're, I say, if you're Agamemnon's biggest problem, you're a pretty big problem, because that's the Lord of Men we're talking about here. And we will see this problem that uh, uh, that, that that heroism poses to political order working itself uh, out in uh, a variety of ways over time. But the central point, I think, is that this, this heroic type, this person willing to risk it all uh, to face death uh, in, uh, in pursuit of uh, this inner sense of, uh, of greatness, can be uh, uh, highly disruptive to political order as it is constituted. Uh, we can have a very good historical example of this uh, in uh, Julius Caesar, a man whose uh, ambition Rome could not contain. Um, he uh, was a very a witty man, at least to judge by uh, the statements that have uh, made it down to us. He said he'd rather be the, uh, the head man in any little village up in the uh, godforsaken Alps rather than second in Rome, and he meant it. Uh, now, there were other Romans, other great Romans, including uh, the one who was ultimately tasked with the uh, assignment of, uh, of trying to stop Julius Caesar, uh, Pompey the Great, uh, who, by some accounts, I, I think, you know, occasionally referred to himself as I, Pompey the Great. You know, he, he was not a man who lacked a sense of, uh, of, of self. Uh, and uh, yet, uh, uh, yet it, it turned out that Rome, that he had no particular ambition for himself that Rome could not fulfill. Um, he had all the honors, he had all the triumphs. He, um, he was called Pompey the Great. This was not a, this was not a, a title handed out lightly. Um, and he was the man to whom Rome turned, the Republic turned in its, in its darkest hour in order to face down uh, this uh, threat from, uh, uh, from Caesar. So there's something that is very um, heroic about Pompey, but nevertheless somehow bounded by the polity uh, of Rome, uh, something that, that could fulfill itself and express itself fully within that. So you, I mean, in a way, I think it would not be unfair to say that Rome had tamed Pompey. Uh, he, there, he, he was, he would not, it would not be necessary for him uh, to, uh, to try to overthrow it uh, in fulfillment of his inner sense of self. Uh, it was more con contained. Um, whereas uh, for Caesar, there really was no alternative. Uh, some have uh, criticized uh, Plutarch for reading uh, Caesar's uh, uh, monumental ambition too far back into, uh, in, into, into his early career. But I, yeah, and that may, there may be some truth to that. But that there was a great fire of ambition burning within Caesar is not in doubt. And so we see just exactly how disruptive this heroic temper uh, can be. Uh, it's a temper that, is, yeah, admittedly, the Republic in the, in the first century uh, BCE was, uh, uh, had some pro had some serious political problems and structural problems, et cetera. Um, so uh, it was not uh, the Republic at its peak it's like 100 years before. But, uh, but it, nevertheless, um, it was uh, something that, that stood in Caesar's way, and so he destroyed it. I mean, he pushed it over. And uh, uh, and this was a tremendous act of political destruction that happened to be accompanied by a tremendous act of political creation, namely establishment more or less of the Roman Empire. He didn't really long survive the, uh, the doing of that, but what he had done could not be undone by, uh, by the people who succeeded him. 
and uh, and so we see on the one hand the hero destroyer, the th supreme threat to uh, political order, and then we see the hero creator, the uh, the, the the founder uh, of of political order. Um, uh, so we have unparalleled acts of destruction, sometimes accompanied by uh, unparalleled acts of uh, uh, of creation as well, in terms of uh, uh, political organization. Um, so then you ha you see a, a sort of temporary resolution of the problem of the hero and the problem of the king, which is the merger of the of, of the hero and the king. Maybe in the cases of the of founders of states, maybe in the, uh, happy circumstances of. Uh, uh, succession, uh, you know, Alexander the Great had a very good education from, uh, by all accounts. Uh, uh, he kept the copy of the, the Iliad that uh, Aristotle had uh, given him under his uh, uh, pillow or whatever it was uh, while he was conquering the world. That was an indication of, uh, I think, a, a, a good uh, sort of education. So we have, the, we have the merger of the hero king and someone who, a, a, a young uh, a young king who is uh, trained up to uh, the heroic qualities that are required to do something like uh, conquering the world, which is uh, you know no small feat, um, and uh, uh, and and so that's uh, that, that's that's one way, uh, the founding another way. But there's still the the difficulty of what happens when the heroic type uh, emerges uh, to contest the political power of a, a king, whether uh, you know heroic or not. And I think, you know, in the course of this book, uh, um, in addition to the, to the study of the various heroes, I, I'm essentially trying to give you a kind of a, a genealogy of politics, if you like, uh, a, a kind of an account from the top down of how political order evolves from rule by simply the strongest to um, other types of rule to the uh, kind of democratic order that we have today. Uh, this is, uh, in essence, uh, a, a, a way of addressing uh, the problem of, uh, of the hero in politics. So let's skip a little bit forward to uh, the Knights of the Round Table. Uh, probably a mythical story, but I, you know I like myths. I think they tell us a lot about things at times. Uh, yeah, as, as, uh, as the uh, as the uh, alternative uh, rock band Red Gold Green say, some stories are true even though they never happen. Um, and I think that uh, the round table is a good example of that. Um, the, uh, uh, so we have, so what's, what's this round table about? Well, this is, uh, you know, according to the Arthurian propaganda, uh, it's about a system of equality uh, in which Arthur is first among equals, whatever that means. Um, and uh, so we, 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 rather than having a, a a descending place of rank order, uh, beginning with the king. Um, you know, we have a we have a circular arrangement, which shows everyone more or less, you know, uh, not quite equal distant. And I said, and of course, I did characterize that as Arthurian propaganda for a reason, because I think there's no doubt who is king under these circumstances. It is Arthur. There is no doubt that. The people sitting closer to Arthur probably are the ones to whom he is closest. He has his favorites, uh, Bedivere and Gawain and you know such. Um, so there's that element uh, that w that needs to be taken into consideration. And I, but I think more to the point in in establishing this kind of a, the system of feudal uh, rights uh, among uh, an aristocratic n group of knights around the uh, round table, what Arthur does is establish a, uh, uh, a system in which the primary relationship of each of those knights is with their sovereign. And any offense that one knight, knight might take and seek to act on in relation to another would also be perceived by uh, the king as an offense against him, therefore e escalating the price. Because if you get your barons warring with one another, um, there are a couple of possible outcomes, some of which are quite bad. Namely, the, one of them will end up winning and being the strongest and will then come for you. And this is not an attractive proposition. So if you subsume these uh, uh, potential passions uh, into an order in which um, uh, the, the, the right is, 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 is rights are conveyed, uh, riches, property, uh, authority, but only contingent upon 
um, the acceptance of this binding personal relationship with the sovereign, it seems to me that you, uh, uh, that you have a, a, a decent attempt at a solution to the problem of the hero uh, in politics. And I'm quite certain that when kings uh, saw their knights uh, engaged in roundtable games, jousting with each other, uh, they were happy uh, because these were games. And game, having your knights play games is much more safe uh, for you than having your knights play politics. They still need to be very good warriors because they have to go fight your wars when you send them to do that. That's not a small thing. But in the meantime, we have a, a, a system that, that attempts to organize that and, uh, uh, and keep it uh, uh, keep it contained. Now, this doesn't always work, obviously. Um, you know, wars of the roses, that kind of thing. Things can get uh, things can get out of hand very easily, and um, and so there, it's not a it's not a perfect solution. But I think it's probably you know in a way a better solution than simply kingdom and court, or you know simply king plus rule of law. You know, a little bit not just tyrannical rule, but something that's a little more organized, gives people a little more understanding of how they are expected to behave. Uh, in exchange for some some degree of freedom, uh, provided they abide by the rules, but again, it's not quite the uh, it's not quite the solution. And and, and you know the, the 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 solution I think you know comes a little bit uh, later and more recently. Uh, and uh, and and that really is ultimately the uh, I think the top down reason um, that uh, a political order kind of becomes democratic. Uh, which is to say, it, it provides substantially more, uh, uh, substantially more protection for itself from disruptions by uh, the heroic type. Uh, the uh, uh, what you see uh, in our world, um, uh, people who are the most potentially capable of uh, disrupting political order are, in a way, the least inclined to do so. The, the single most trusted institution in the United States um, is the U.S. military. Uh, and uh, really, the, the numbers are off the charts. They've been, uh, they're, they're, you, you, you trust the U.S. military to do the right thing most of the time. Um, and 70 percent, 80 percent of Americans. Uh, even 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 at the low point, uh, you know, b well before uh, you know the kind of post-Vietnam era, it was still well over 50. Of course, there were higher levels of trust for other institutions of government now, which have pretty much cratered. But uh, but the military is, and and you know, and we occasionally go to movies like you know the classic Seven Days in May, in which there's this elaborate you know military coup being plotted at the top echelons of uh, uh, the generals and the joint chiefs and, and such. Um, but I think you know that too is uh, an illustrative example, not of the danger that uh, the military poses in our society today, but actually of the opposite. Who foils the coup in seven days in May? Well, it's a colonel. What does that mean? Well, who, who is this colonel? Uh, uh, you know, the colonel is is a guy who sees his senior officers plotting. He agrees with the substance of their complaint against the political order, which is that uh, you know we're being self sold out to the Soviets or something like that. I don't care. Details, but um, uh, but he uh, you know he, he doesn't want to uh, participate in this military coup. He is fully vested in the politics of our democratic society, uh, and I think that is highly characteristic uh, of uh, of colonels in the United States military today. Why would they risk everything in order to be to have their own personal rights subsumed? Uh, to some mercurial general who's decided that he ought to be uh, uh, in charge of the place. There's just not really much in the way of <clears throat> Bonapartist tendency uh, in, in the US military today. And I, you know, I submit that, uh, that, this, is, uh, that this is unusual uh, historically. Uh, and, and again, a kind of an indication of the extent to which uh, uh, we, the, this, this heroic tendency, the dangerous element of it, has been to some significant degree tamed. Um, now, usually when we uh, tell the story of the development of democracy, we tell it from the uh, uh, bottom up. Uh, it's this spirit that starts bubbling among people and, yeah, as we say, say it, uh, stand for die Luft der Freiheit weg, and, uh, weg, uh, weg excuse me. Um, you know, the air of freedom is blowing. Um, 
and uh, you know, I, there's a little. I think there's an element of that in uh, in Tocqueville's uh, descriptions in Democracy in America. Um, it's certainly, uh, you know, Nietzsche uh, perceived it and despised it. Um, but there was always sort of the question of how exactly does it something that was in Nietzsche's view lower um, might actually uh, take down something that I mean, Nietzsche thought was higher, namely this sort of aristocratic virtue. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and it was a good question, because uh, how, how, how does something lower take down something higher? Well, what I'd like to suggest is that, uh, in the first place, I, I, would, I would reject that uh, uh, particular categorization of, of lower and higher. But I would like to say that, uh, that in a way, as, as, uh, to the extent that we can say political order is a thing, um, with some sense of itself and some consciousness of itself, uh, it becomes more conscious of uh, threats to its uh, continuation and adapts. And in the, ad the, ad the adaptation uh, is in, a, uh, uh, in the direction of uh, uh, democratic and egalitarian order. Uh, it's the uh, uh, it's it's a, it's it's a solution, uh, maybe an imperfect solution. We shall uh, we shall see. Uh, if you would like to uh, uh, characterize this as a kind of uh, Hegelian Kozhevian resolution of the problem, I would have no great objection to that. Um, and uh, but I think it's uh, uh, it, it it's it's the way we live now. And uh, so I will. I, I did not. I, I've deliberately saved all of my. Uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, heroic uh, material for the question and answer period, and so I'll stop now, and when uh, we can take it from there. Oh, uh, thanks so much, Todd. No questions? Yes, over here. Oh, well, let me take up that invitation because, uh, as you were winding up, uh, it occurred to me that. Uh, um, that uh, I, well, I haven't, actually I haven't discussed this specific point, I guess, with Harvey, but I suspect that he and I might also agree, uh, not only in being terrified by Trump as president, but I think not being completely terrified uh, that we probably both have enough confidence in the in American, in America's nature, traditions, history, to believe that the country could successfully survive even a President Trump. Uh, in other words, that our nation has solved what you term the problem of the hero so well. Um, maybe we, I, I, I may be the only person in the room who's read the novel of the 1930s. Uh, called It Can't Happen Here, hmm. uh, about a um, dictatorship coming to the United States. But I guess I, what I'm really arguing is that uh, our nation has solved the problem of the hero, we hope, well enough so that uh, Bonapartism cannot happen here. Your thoughts, please. Thanks. Well, I think it's a very good question. Now, um, the last chapter of my book actually throws cold water on the entire thesis that I've been developing, raising the question of whether it can indeed happen here. And unfortunately, I think uh, that um, uh, there is, a, a, you know, there's a kind of an interesting uh, empirical uh, example of this. And, uh, you know, it's uh, Germany in the 1930s. Um, uh, I don't say that those conditions are parallel to what we have at the moment, we have, but you had, a, uh, you had a, a, a weak liberal government that was unable to withstand a, uh, a concentrated assault by someone who was bent on acquiring absolute power. Um, so I think that, um, uh, the way I put this in the, uh, uh, toward the end of the book, which was actually written, of course, well before the, the Trump phenomenon, was that you know, there, are two, there are two basic problems. Uh, one is related to the exterior of what I've called the modern world, you know, that's the, which would be the kind of bin Laden problem, uh, a heroic type, indisputably, uh, obviously motivated by, uh, uh, by uh, you know, an inner sense of greatness and purpose, uh, and also, you know, someone whom millions of people around the world do regard as uh, a hero. Uh, so uh, this is not the, 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 the relative safety of the, of the modern world itself. Uh, 
in terms of uh, its ability to prevent such a character from emerging is not proof against assault from outside, and that, you know, that one must be uh, uh, very aware of that. Uh, if uh, uh, it, you know, some people think, well, you know, modernization theory is we all get richer, we kind of deal out the possibility of any of these things getting re representing serious challenges, et cetera. Well, you know, I mean, if modernization theory is true now, then it was also true in 1934. Uh, so, I mean, there, there was a, that was a pretty big bump in the road of, toward modernization that followed from that. Um, and then, you know, there's the, uh, then there's the internal question. Um, you know, does, does somebody uh, have, is there potential uh, in circumstances that I, I would have thought would have had to be considerably more dire than our current circumstances, but say, you know, a decade of no economic growth uh, and escalating crime rate and people, you know, retreating into their enclaves of their gated communities, the ones who had the money, and everybody else being more or less left alone in places where the police won't even really go. Uh, and then suppose somebody appeared on the scene saying, I can help, you know, I can, I can take care of this for you. Uh, we, can, we can work it out. We can, uh, uh, you know, that would not, we, would not, we would not call that person the leader, because that term is fraught. But you know, we would, we, you know, you might, there might be a point at which you could, you could see the possibility of a, a democratic society getting, uh, um, getting interested in saving itself by giving up the qualities that make it liberal and democratic. Um, so uh, I, I, I think these are these are continu these are continuous continuing sources of worry. Uh, you know the. Uh, even at the end of history, uh, there, are, there are two camps, the people who think that it's the end of history and the people who say it's too soon to tell. <laughs> and this is, a, you know, this is a problem. Uh, so, I mean, I, now, now specifically in relation to Trump, uh, well, I mean, look, I, 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 is there any doubt that when, you know, when Trump looks at himself in the mirror, he sees a heroic figure? <laughs> um, somebody asked me what, what, once what, what, I, what, what I thought you know, Trump might think of Achilles. And I said, well, if, you know, I think if Trump thought about it, he'd say that if Achilles were born today, he'd want to grow up to be Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you, you have talked about Achilles referring to uh, ancient heroes, but what about Odysseus? Because Odysseus is a hero too. Yes. And compared to Achilles, he is the clever hero, the polymatis polytrochos. And so uh, I think that uh, it is interesting to consider also this aspect of the picture because perhaps it is a bit disruptive of a picture regarding ancient heroes only based on Achilles. And a second question which is uh, related to this is uh, whether perhaps we uh, um, are misunderstanding a little bit the approach of liberal society. Um, so perhaps it is less Achillean but more Odyssean in this that uh, while saying that um, everything is done just to defend, to prevent the losses of uh, com comrades, mm. um, liberal societies too are trying to establish their power. I mean, perhaps Schmidt was wrong. Perhaps he, he misunderstood, at least to a certain extent, what liberalism is. And um, so I think that we should try to, by using the figure of Odysseus to have a more complex picture in mind, we should try to deal with this yeah. possibility too. Well, uh, there's no question that, uh, that Odysseus is, is a great hero. I mean, you know, Homer wrote two books, right? Uh, one is uh, one's about Achilles, um, one's about uh, Odysseus. So that's, well, I, since I regard him as a pretty great informative figure, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that that, 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 may, that may set out um, one of the great uh, contrasts uh, of, of, of all time in terms of perceptions of, of, of heroes. I think Odysseus is easier to take in modern society. Uh, I think uh, it, he, he is more adaptable to our needs because of his uh, pragmatic cleverness. Uh, I think Achilles is a more challenging figure to accept uh, in, in terms of his uh, heroic outlook. 
Uh, I also think that, that Odysseus is, is I, I don't, by the way, regard Achilles as a tragic hero. Uh, I think he acted uh, out of uh, fealty to himself in the knowledge that he would die uh, and that death, uh, per se, uh, at the end of that is not, uh, uh, is, is, is not enough to qualify him as, as tragic. I mean, you, uh, the, the, the tragic flaw element of it from, you know, from, uh, uh, from, from, from Aristotle and later, uh, I, th I think is somewhat misapplied in relation to him. I do, however, think that Odysseus is a bit of a comic hero. Uh, you know, the man who will do what is necessary to save his skin. He will lie, he will cheat, he will uh, um, uh, behave badly. Uh, it, it, it's also interesting, I think, you know, the, so the title of my book, The Heroic Heart, comes from Tennyson's poem, Ulysses. Uh, Although we are not now that strength which moved, in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are one equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Uh, so that's Odysseus, uh, Ulysses, in his old age, looking at his son, now the king, and the people who he, they rule over, and finding they're nothing of interest, nothing to challenge him. And so this is... Repeat the title of your book, please. The Heroic Heart, Greatness, Ancient and Modern. Right. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so, what's, so Ulysses decided he's, you know, he's going to go back out to sea. He's going to go look, see if they can find the Happy Isle and meet... Uh, Achilles again and, and, and such. And, and, but there's a real problem uh, in, in the poem, uh, which is uh, uh, the poem is set up as if a, a Odysseus is addressing his mariners from the Odyssey. But they're all dead. He um, left, uh, he, you know, he, he didn't save them. He saved him. That was, t that was priority number one. Um, uh, you know, the, the, and, and so I, mean, I, I, so I, th I think that, that, that it's more complicated in, uh, in both ways. I think it's, 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 it's a little too easy to find Odysseus to be wholly attractive, and it's a little too uh, easy to find uh, the defects in Achilles these days. So I would argue for a balanced perspective. Uh, I, you know, as to, as to who's the greater hero, I mean, you know, I, 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 I think um, uh, that, that, that Odysseus is more or less the exceptional type. Um, but uh, by the way, you know, I, I, you know, I've talked a bit about the saving hero, and I, and I should mention that, uh, that, of course, the saving hero is not a new character he's, 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 in, in terms of someone who emerges only with the modern world and uh, democrat democratizing egalitarian elements. This, the, the saving hero goes way back too, and uh, you know, my example of this actually is from the Iliad, and that's uh, uh, that's Patroclus, who was uh, suicide charge into the. Uh, uh, into the battle and uh, eventually draws Achilles back into the fight, and immediately draws Achilles back into the fight, which allows the Greeks to survive uh, another day and then be delivered uh, the final victory in the war by Odysseus, of course, taking place outside the frame of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the book. So you see, uh, okay, I don't know if, if I were... Um, uh, maybe, maybe there would be something, you know, commercial in, you know, how Patroclus saved Western civilization or something like that. Although, although frankly, I doubt it. But, but you know, it might be worth a try. I mean, if they, if they tried it with the, the, the Irish and, and, and everybody else. But so, yeah. anyway. Actually, uh, with respect to the heroes and having mentioned the, the Irish, there is an intriguing ancient hero by the name of Cuhulan, uh, uh for the Irish, who actually I think is superior to Achilles. When he was young, he was, uh, and he wanted to get some arms, uh, the, uh, his um, adopted father, was not go who was the king, was not going to give them to him because he told him he either had a choice of that he could fight and have a short life and, and his name would live on for ages, or he could uh, not fight and he would be unknown. And his response was, "That's an easy choice. I want to be uh, want to be known." So it's so I've always thought that, that he was in that sense superior to Achilles. But that's really not my, not my the the question I have goes to your initial comments, you know, about the uh, congressional um, award and and so forth uh, in the early '70s. Uh, I spent six years in the in the Infantry National Guard, which meant I had to go four four months for active duty. And I think it was seventy once. So it was at the height of the Vietnam War. And what 
And and I went there. Uh, you know, first of all, I was I was very strongly anti-war, so I, but I didn't have any choice because of a draft draft number. But I was really anticipating what was what was going to be the ba- basic uh, uh, message of the training. And the thing which which I came away with, besides kind of self-preservation, was that it was all focused towards the unit. It was almost like it was a brotherhood yeah. that, and that these were the people that you were going to, you know, risk your life for, try to try to save and so forth. And I'm, I'm wondering if this thing on you know saving the life, uh, is not related to that. That you know people do these things not for, any great glory, you know, you know uh, glory for the country or, or so forth, but it's something, to try to save their buddies. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's exactly on point. And in fact, there's a, a, a fair bit of social science literature that points to exactly this. What, so what is the real motivation, not only in the unit in war, but also uh, among the, the firefighters Fire on right, 9-11? Yeah. And, and it's, it's about not failing the guy next to you. Yeah. It's about this, cult, this culture. culture. Uh, this, uh, this little, it seems like it's something that we should describe in somewhat stronger terms than that. But this bond uh, of... Uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of a solidarity of you know yeah we're we, we're all we're all in this together. I won't let you down. You won't let me down. If you fall, I will come to get you. If if I fall, you will come to get me. Mm-hmm. And the, it's a, it seems to be a very you know very very powerful um, uh, motivator. And, and and in fact, it it may, it may be the uh, you know the, the the best description of of what motivates people and and extremists. And and it's it's interesting that you know that, that we have learned. Uh, and, and, and we have not unlearned this uh, uh, over the years, notwithstanding the, um, uh, the extraordinary impetus toward individual autonomy that comes with liberalism, et cetera, that this is still something that can coexist alongside it uh, and defend it, uh, mm-hmm. which is uh, obviously uh, pretty important unless liberalism is ultimately a kind of suicide pact. <clears throat> I just wanted to follow up on that. I, I spent some time in the Infantry National Guard about 30 years later, and the first thing I noticed training was all that you described, but also, are you here as a soldier or a civilian? There was a real clear distinction. What, what, what was meant by that distinction? You don't show up jacked up as a soldier. Civilians don't care how they dress. You, you stand a certain way. Civilians don't care how they stand. You look out for the person next to you. Civilians don't look out for each other. So in other words, you're defending something, but from a position of superiority. I mean, that's that. I would put that as a challenge to the. Yeah, no, the I, I think that's. I, I think that's uh, fair. Co-option of this. Yeah. Uh, uh, Not that anyone's going to follow some general to take over the government, but saying there's something superior about this commitment to what other people, especially in a, in a realm of choice. Well, I don't think where, there's, where you're not I, I, think it's, I think your point is excellent. I, I don't think there's any doubt, but that um, say um, uh, special forces operators in the US military have a strong sense of their superiority um, as fighters. Um, but do they then subsequently attempt to attach a status to that that transfers from this realm where their superiority is uh, desirable and recognized uh, into a more a broader claim of, uh, uh, of of superiority that they would assert publicly against uh, egalitarian claims of others. I don't really think so. Um, you know, if if anything, there is a kind of a uh, a privately held view of this elite of the elite, uh, which you know, uh, apparently you know, Chris Kyle was called uh, utterly without irony by people uh, in in the military, <laughs> the legend. I mean, can you imagine someone at, at Harvard being called the legend with an entirely without irony? I don't think I can imagine. I can just add one, one comment to that. Uh, it's probably why my, when I was in basic training, uh, my company commander repeatedly told me that my problem was that I thought like a civilian. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had gotten my, this was just as they were going into the voluntary army, so they had set up it had been mandated to have councils, trainee councils. So I got myself elected to it, which meant that on a weekly basis I could go and complain to the, the to the company commander about everything. So repeatedly, that was his response to my complaints: "Is I 
thought like a civilian. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear also from Alex, another strongly military spirit that goes <laughs> with his PhD. And then, and then maybe uh, we can uh, let the military types uh, subside. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, okay, but what, what, is, what is Alex going to say? Well, may have participated. He's been in the, he's been in the Israeli Army. Artillery shell from uh, 30 kilometers away. I mean, the question then is, is there, does the army simply whitewash the fact that a heroism involves also killing enemies? And the way that you presented both the way that uh, the Medals of Honor were awarded, and then that Chris Kyle, who, as you said, is sniping people from a distance and has killed hundreds. Yeah. It, it's all about saving comrades. It's not about killing enemies, but of course, when bin Laden was killed, that was viewed as a heroic act. So you can't simply make that decision. Well, no, yeah, it's complicated, obviously. So why is, why, is, why is it heroic to kill bin Laden? Well, because he's a villain. Um, and what's a villain? Well, I think a villain is a hero who is not a liberal. Uh, and wants to do in the liberal world, <laughs> and uh, and that's uh, th this resonates. I don't think there's any doubt uh, in among senior commanders in the army, some of whom I have a chance to interact with at uh, at my institution, like uh, Mad Dog Jim Mattis, the former CENTCOM commander, and Gary Roughhead, one of the uh, few admirals in the uh, Navy who commanded both the Atlantic and Pacific Fleet before he became uh, chief of naval operations. They know what they're doing. They know that their job is to yeah. kill. Um, you wouldn't have to save anyone if you weren't involved in killing. Well, you know, but but you know, you're doing it. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it it's at a minimum of something in which you are not supposed to take particular pleasure, at least, especially at senior command ranks. Uh, it is a regrettable necessity at times. This killing. Um, it is always done. Uh, not for the purpose of killing, but to achieve an objective, a legitimate political objective, uh, in accordance with our constitutional <laughs> procedures involving a chain of command. It's not up to the soldiers. Um, and so these are the ways in which we have, you could say, rationalized it. But I don't think it's merely a rationalization. I think we've liberalized it. I think that we have subsumed it, uh, uh, this, this extraordinarily powerful, dangerous impulse, into uh, an, a, a, a liberal order that contains it. Uh, in a way that uh, you know, the, it, it's not it's not in a containment even as as challenging as the as the Roman one that contained Pompey. Uh, it but it but it's been very effective. Yes, um, isn't yeah. risk a big factor though? Uh, I mean, if you're killing, isn't how much risk you put yourself at a big factor? Yeah, I, you know, I, in fact, I think one of the distinct features of the hero of the, uh, the classical. Period uh, and, and, and is generally regarded as this sort of willingness to um, face death, to risk death, violent death, um, and usually um, in the in the story that the critics of modernity tell, um, you know we've leveled that out. We don't have the uh, opportunities in liberal democratic societies for these for the heights of achievement. Now, nobody gets to conquer the world anymore. You know, it's not on the table. If you, if you display um, Bonapartist or Alexandrian tendencies on the playground, they're probably going to you know, get you some counseling, if not indeed some medication. <laughs> and uh, so, so in order to, so maybe we've elevated the low a little bit, but we've also brought the, you know, brought, chopped the high down uh, to size. And you know, I, I'm not going to dismiss that too core, but I will say that, uh, uh, no, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think that there's, um, there still is this life risking going on, and, and uh, you know, of some, where's it come from? I don't know what the what the source of the impulse is, but uh, take I don't know if you many of you are f far too young to remember an episode in which a, a plane uh, crashed into the uh, <coughs> Potomac River, and it's about 19, 1983, uh, uh, Chesley, having taken. Schellenberger. 
Well, no, but that's another good example. Oh, that's, yeah, that, that was the, he's the guy who, who there, by the way, uh, in the event of a water landing, says the uh, statement that, that, that when they put you on the plane, until Chesley Sullenberger landed that plane <laughs> on the Hudson River, there had never been a water landing. <laughs> there were water crashings, <laughs> um, but no, that was a first uh, on a com in commercial aviation. And it, it's abs absolutely, I mean, the, the sheer you know, technical genius of performance under extreme pressure. I mean, a clearly heroic conduct. Uh, he, he had his own life to save as well, uh, true. But, um, but, you know, just the, the sheer miracle of the number of people who didn't die that day as a result of him. But no, I was, so this, the plane takes off out of uh, uh, National Airport, now Reagan National Airport, to uh, lose its power somehow, crashes near the 14th Street Bridge. And, and uh, there's survivors, and there's, one, there's a woman in the water, and she's partly injured. She can't reach the, uh, the, 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 the life belt that's being extended down to her from, uh, I guess, a helicopter. And so there's this, there, you know, there are people were driving by, including this one federal government uh, file clerk. His name was Lenny Skutnik. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people on the scene at this point, the first responders, medical, you know, police, et cetera. Um, but this woman is clearly having trouble. And so he dives in the water of the Potomac. It's January. It's cold. Um, you know, uh, and gets this woman uh, uh, on, you know, onto the life belt. And they, you know, they haul her out, and he climbs back up on the bank, gets in the car, drives away. <laughs> you know, what, what, what's that? You know, that, I mean, there's no, uh, there's, there's, there's the, 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 he lays it all the, on, on the line, and then, you know, he's perfectly content to go back. You know, eventually they found him, you know, and he was, uh, and he was recognized, uh, and rightly so, by the president at the State of the Union as, as, a, as a true hero. Uh, but, uh, um, but you know, where did that come from? Uh, it's certainly, there's no, there's, there's nothing, there's no, there was no desire for glory involved in that. There was this uh, sort of uh, extreme need. I do think that. Uh, uh, so there's uh, the, there's some sketching. There's a little bit of a sketch in here of a uh, of a broader sense of connection uh, on, on, uh, in the heroic temperament uh, to um, in the modern sort uh, to uh, generosity. So when uh, we ask people who their heroes are. Sometimes they say things like, uh, "Well, I had this coach, you know, who really got something out of me," or "I had this teacher, uh, a professor, even in some instances, rare though they may be," um, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, somebody who really kind of gave me more than you know I thought I had coming to me. Um, and, you know, maybe it's a minister, maybe yeah, any time. And and so you know, what so what is this? What is it, what does it mean when people say that's 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 their hero? Uh, well, uh, is this a kind of a, uh, a a dumbing down of heroism? I mean, I think that's an easy way to look at that. Uh, Harvey sent me a, a terrific email. I see that nominations are now open for the Harvard Heroes uh, program, which I, I guess is to honor Harvard staff who have done things above and beyond, beyond the call of duty. Professors are not eligible, by the way, for the Harvard Heroes Award, <laughs> uh, which I, I think is an excellent, uh, is, is an excellent indication of where, where Harvard views heroes as standing in relation to the professors. Lower Why is the answer. Why aren't professors eligible? No, That's uh, discrimination. You know, uh, I, I think they're, that, they're all heroes. I, I think we'd have to go back to my, uh, some of my comments about the, uh, uh, the aristocracy uh, in order to, uh, to appreciate that more fully. But, so, but is it a dumbing down? No, I, 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 no I, in a sense, I suppose, but, but actually what it, I think it points to a continuum. It's a, it's a continuum of generosity. Uh, in its most extreme form, it's Lenny Skutnik. It's the 9-11 firefighters. It's people who are, you know, who are willing to end some, you know, 356 firefighters died in the 9-11. Uh, but you know, farther down the rung, uh, the rungs of, of this of the same ladder. Uh, you know, th th the first step is the is the uh, is, is this kind of uh, generosity of spirit beyond the call of duty that people sometimes exhibit toward uh, one another. And then you know, you can find uh, the, you can find this sort of uh, caring will. I called it um, uh, expressing itself in greater and greater degrees of. Uh, uh, difficulty and and, uh, and and challenge up to the up to the ultimate, where you give your life for the stranger, um, and I think that's a very powerful human impulse, and uh, and and one frankly that is, that is stood in its current form, uh, in a way that say the will to power has not persisted in the form in which Nietzsche described it over millennia. 
Martha, why don't you go? Sure. Um, I don't want to take us too far afield, but I'm, uh, I'm wondering about your understanding of a hero. And, um, and I'd like also to uh, remove it somewhat from the, from the military context, or wonder if you would. And I'm thinking specifically of um, uh, Socrates and Thomas More. And I'm wondering if, um, if one could be heroic not by killing, but by dying. Um, both of those men were self-regarding mm. in the sense that you right. suggest or had self-respect. And, and their deaths, certainly, uh, or their lives more particularly, I suppose, were a challenge to their respective regimes. So I'm just wondering. Um, I'm just wondering. Yes. No, you're, you're right. To, you're, I think you're absolutely on point. Uh, Socrates is a, uh, is, a, is a great character. There's, a, there's another book on heroism recently came out by a guy, a guy called uh, Ari Cohen, K-O-H-E-N, um, which you should order alongside my book. Um, and, uh, and he in it makes the argument that uh, the, the death of Socrates is an example of uh, this sort of uh, service to others, de de a death on behalf of others. Uh, you know, a willingness to accept death uh, for others. I, I, I am not fully persuaded that that's the best example from the classical world, but I do think that um, that y you could make the case that, uh, and as people have, that, uh, that Socrates' death uh, was um, a service uh, in a way to philosophy uh, and its ability to uh, endure. Um, other examples, well, I mean, there's, there is somebody whom some billions of individuals alive today call savior um, and I think that's uh, that's that's uh, that's an example as well um, you know there's uh, you, it's not always um, martial uh, you know and uh, uh, and I think you know. Uh, I think one of the one of the one of the stories that I enjoyed telling in the book was that of Lucretia, uh, who, uh, in order to prove her case against the uh, the son of the king of Rome who has raped her, kills herself. Uh, uh, it's Tuscan king, wasn't it, Tarquin? Yes. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, Tarquin was the uh, was the heir to the uh, the throne of Rome back at, during the days of the kingdom. Uh, and in fact, the, set, the, 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 the political disorder, disruption set in motion by, not intentionally, I don't think, but, but, but by Lucretia's actions actually led to the overthrow of the, uh, uh, of the kingdom of Rome and the establishment of the, uh, uh, of the republic. So there are, you know, there are instances in which um, you know, this, this kind of uh, uh, sacrifice uh, is, uh, is every bit as politically influential and, and, and decisive, I think. So yeah, good, very good. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, listen, Todd, I always speak up for women. And the yes. mention of Lucretia, um, <laughs> um, me, um, this has gone on long enough. And <coughs> there, so there is this word heroin. Yes. And uh, so uh, yes. Jane Austen has used it. Henry James has used it. And uh, it's commonly used, in fact. Yes. And so what about, uh, I, what do you say? Well, I, you know, I, I think uh, um, if, the, if, if all it takes to be the, uh, uh, the heroine is to be protagonist in a Jane Austen novel, then uh, that's, that's, that's fine, too. But it's a, little, uh, it's a little bit of a modification, I think, from the, from the classical sense. Uh, and I think Lucretia is heroic in that classical sense, in a way that Jane Austen mm -hmm. heroines are not. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, uh, but, but, but I, I agree. The term could use a little more uh, uh, currency, except it seems to have run afoul of, uh, well, you know, mod modern life writ large. It's why we don't have stewardesses anymore. We have flight attendants, or we don't have stewards. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, non-gender specified. Um, I, I'll admit, I, you know, I, I didn't find it necessary to pick any additional fights in, in my book. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so heroines are part of the feminine mystique and they've been swallowed up by gender neutrality. Is that what you mean? No, I think that's what, uh, I think that's what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dan, or, or Carly, let's say. Uh, Carly and then Dan. Um, <laughs> why is it, do you think, that even today, when 
I mean, I was struck by just how private modern heroism is, right? We don't know the names of the firefighters who went into the Twin Towers. I mean, mm -hmm. you can look them up, yeah. but you know, I, mm -hmm. we'd all be hard pressed to name any of them. And yet we still regard them as extraordinary, no, extraordinarily noble. Um, even today with the taming of the passions and the heroic passions that you've mentioned, heroism still seems to require risking death. Um, so, the, I mean, so we haven't gone so far as to just only regard, so say, people like Steve Jobs as heroes, <laughs> right? Um, but even in the modern age, mm -hmm. for some reason, heroism has to require facing death and maybe dying, making that sacrifice. Um, and so, whether or being willing to make that sacrifice, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, and so I, would, I was just, I, I was just going to, I'd like to, I'd just like to ask you to say more about whether you think the life-saving emphasis for modern heroes is really the most important thing, or is it sort of the willingness to make this noble sacrifice yeah. that is just as important? Um, and if so, is the, is what's going on that we're just less clear about it now than maybe the, the, you know, they were in, in Greece and maybe Rome, and how does that affect the rest of us politically, not just the heroes, yeah. but those of us who live in the No, that's, that's very good. Uh, I, I, you know, what I would say is, um, um, in the first place, there are people who regard Steve Jobs. Yeah, there are. Uh, you know, but I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to, what, I, what I'm trying to, uh, what I was trying to isolate was what I would take to be the highest form uh, of heroism characteristic of the ancient world uh, and of the modern world, yeah. and to note the differences uh, and the similarities, frankly. Uh, and, and to me, this, the fundamental similarity at this extremely high level is the willingness to face death and to do uh, in the face of death uh, what others would not do. Um, and that's, uh, the, you know, that's, the, that's, the, that's the top. But, it's, but it really is just the top of the, uh, of the staircase. Um, and, you know, and, I, and I think there are, you know, there are other forms of, of, of heroism. Uh, below that, uh, you know, um, uh, some people do things at great risk to reputation. Um, there's a, you know, there's the uh, uh, Ibsen's uh, play, uh, with, uh, which is not, which I always have a mental block on because it's not yeah, the doctor. Enemy of the people. Enemy of the people. Thank you. Uh, so, Doctor Stockman. Uh, has, uh, has discovered that the, the waters of, of the town, the, 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 the spa town, have been contaminated by a, that's a tannery up the road or something like that, I can't remember. And, and he discovers this on the eve of the tourist season, and he takes this information to his brother, the mayor, uh, and, uh, uh, and expecting that well, you know, he'll do the right thing, which is to, you know, he'll close the baths, and, and he won't, because you know, the, whole, the whole economy is dependent on this tourist season that's coming up. And then he takes his case to the public, and they shut him down, and uh, uh, and and he, uh, you know, he, he he's uh, he, he knows he's right. Uh, he, 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 by the way, Ibsen's identification with him in the play is 100 percent. We're this is a polemical play, uh, and uh, uh, and and it's you know it, it's an ex, it, it's he's he is heroic for his willingness to speak the truth at personal risk uh, and and adversity, uh, and so I think you know that. Certainly, is conduct of a kind that is heroic, even if not immediately life-risking. Now, maybe it's maybe it's a notch down, um, and, uh, uh, and 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 you know. The, uh, but the other thing that I think is interesting about the 9/11, I'm, I'm, I'm actually hoping to do some survey research and then not to do some future in order to prove this, uh, but um, where, which is to say, test my hypothesis. Sorry. Uh, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I think that you would, you, you, you know, if you, if you look at um, uh, certain kinds of, you, you, we, this is a democratic open society. We, we, opinions differ on subjects, including who's a hero and who's not a hero. And of course, partisan passions work into it and all the rest of it. I, mean, I think you could make a perfectly plausible case that both John McCain and Barack Obama were heroic in their different ways in 2008. Um, uh, yet few would have done so. Uh, it would have been a division based on you know who's, whose side you were on, um, and in in that sense, uh, any kind of claim of heroism comes with a kind of contested uh, counterclaim. 
um, except the 9/11 firefighter, and that would be my point. Uh, if, if you know, if there's if there's a figure whom you know 90 percent or more of Americans think is in principle uh, is, is not in principle, in fact, you know, heroic, then I think that means something. That tells us something. It tells us about what we what we value once we get past all the things that might divide us. Dan. Thanks, Todd. Um, I'm struck in your title of the book, The yeah. Heroic Heart. When yeah. I hear the word heart, I think much more of the Hebrew lev than I do of Greek care or care of. Yeah. And then even the way Tennyson reads the poem and reverses it seems like a kind of biblicization of the Homeric story. And then how many of your examples building on that are sort of other directed, dying for the stranger, generosity of spirit, a will of care, and you know, just a few minutes ago mentioning kind of Jesus. And I'm wondering if you could say more about the effects of the biblical dispensation on heroism. You seem to have sort of two categories. The military ones, which seem sort of classical, aristocratic, warrior, you know, Aristotle's discussion of courage and the ethics and how echoes of it. And then this other group, which seems somewhat more bourgeois, more humble, closer to us, and yet more resonant, which all seem vaguely biblical to me. Um, question mark. Hmm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where to go with vaguely biblical. How biblical? And, and in what in what way? Well, uh, if you're dying for a stranger or generosity, or you know, think of the you know, all these things that are heir to what you know Nietzsche would call the ascetic ideal, whether it's humanitarianism, a saintly type, or even a great scientist, a kind of Einstein, that's a kind of hero. Um, you know, what, you, you seem to be grasping for a lot of these kinds of examples as well, not just the warrior, mm -hmm. and they all seem to be animated more by this biblical spirit, uh, then by pride, superiority, uh, dying. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think that would make a good essay on my book. I'm, I'm not sure if I have an answer to it. Will you publish but, it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm out of the editing business, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I think that that is very interesting. I, you know, I, one of the things, one of the things I realized uh, actually, as I was. Uh, uh, facing up the pro to the prospect of writing this book was that, in principle, uh, the research agenda for a book like this is infinite, uh, and I could easily have spent another, um, you know, 20 years uh, collecting matter and developing cases and testing the kind of limits of what I'm saying against uh, some other things that one, uh, you know, ought uh, probably to have uh, uh, considered, in including, and. Uh, uh, and you know I'm 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 not done with the subject either, um, but uh, no I mean the, you know the, I, I, there's not enough frankly there there's not enough to criticize book. Uh, Malice used to say criticize self. Um, uh, you know there's not enough non-Western stuff in here. I mean there's 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 Gilgamesh which I think is a fantastic uh, story and and very interestingly uh, parallels uh, the relationship of. Uh, uh, Achilles and Patroclus on the one hand, and uh, uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu uh, on the other. Um, there's uh, there's not enough um, there's not enough non-Western stuff. There's, certain, there's not enough biblical stuff. I really wanted to spend a little bit more time with uh, uh, looking at, at heroism in the, in in the Hebrew Bible in particular. Um, and, but you know, for stories for another day, I guess. Oh, uh, Lewis, and uh, then Peter. Yeah. Just on the question of what motivates heroes, would you say that heroes, even those like Achilles, are always ultimately motivated by some desire to benefit other people or to benefit some community of which they feel themselves to be a part or not? No. Uh, and, and, you know, I think um, Achilles is, 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 in a way, the classic example of the opposite tendency. You know, he has. Um, uh, he knows how important his war fighting skills are and his example is uh, to the cause of the Greeks against the Trojans. Uh, in fact, uh, the Trojans are uh, at the peak of the crisis, just about to set fire to the, to the boats of the Greeks and push them into the, into the water. Uh, the Greeks, uh, game over. Uh, Trojan War goes to the Trojans. Um, Western civilization never really gets going. Um, well, I mean, that, that might have been an extreme. Um, counterfactuals are always you know, fun, but but uh, so so you, so, you, so so Achilles is, is, is in a way precisely not doing this for others. Uh, but 
um, you know, the, the, the ancient world, you know, we tend to regard sort of Alexander the Great as a hero of the ancient world. And this, one of the reasons we do this, we were able to do this, is because um, that was a long time ago. And because at the time, whether you perceived Alexander to be a hero probably depended on whether you were with him doing the conquering or whether you were being conquered by him. And uh, so none of which may have all that much to do with the, the ambition of Alexander. Uh, in a sense, you've got a character, um, Alexander, who uh, gets adopted. I mean, he's actually the king of his people. But, but, uh, but he's, um, uh, you know, he, he proceeds as, uh, as, as their man, their representative. Whether, and that's how, uh, that's how people view him from below, whether or not that's how he views himself uh, from up high. And so I think that's, in a way, the, uh, the, uh, the distinction, or a distinction. Um, you know, uh, Lincoln uh, called the, you know, the man who saved the Union. Uh, and, and indeed, I, you know, I do believe that he set himself the task of saving the Union. I don't think there was anything disingenuous about it. But, but the man who writes the, in the Gettysburg Address, the single most memorable speech ever given by an American politician, that they will uh, little note nor long remember what we say here. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, they, they, you know, there's, there's, there's been a lot more forgetfulness about the people who died on that battlefield than there has been over that speech. And so Lincoln, I think, was an extraordinarily uh, am ambitious man. And heroic? Uh, uh, sure. I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm willing to. But now, admittedly, but you, now, we're, now we're in an interesting category because there are some, uh, there's some bitter enders south of the Mason-Dixon line who think he was the greatest villain uh, in American history. And so that's not a consensus figure. I mean, it's, pro it's, 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 it's it, it, as sort of past presidents go, it's, it's, it's up there. I mean, it's it probably you know, second, to, um, may, may, second to Washington, maybe even ahead of Washington in terms of regard that people express for him. Uh, but, uh, but again, not entirely uncontested. Peter. Um, when the, uh, Lincoln just came up, I was going to ask about uh, your, your talk put me in mind of his Lyceum speech. Um, where as a young man he grappled with the question of whether truly great ambition can be content to um, fit within an existing order and, and Lincoln found a way preserving the existing order mm -hmm. at least I think by implication if, if it's a good order mm -hmm. um, and you noted that Caesar was not content to remain within the, the Roman polity at the time um, one could wonder if to what extent was there a Roman polity worth preserving by that time um, That's I would I would kind of quibble a bit regarding Pompey, but it's not just about Pompey to, to what extent he was content since he seemed like he had wanted to be a Caesar, but kind of wasn't as ambitious, wasn't as energetic in, in pursuing it. But it, it, it seems like only the especially virtuous figures by that time, Cicero and Cato, were really uh, unambiguously content to stay within the Republic, mm. within the existing polity. Um, but when Lincoln stayed within the existing order, it was an impressive order at the time, and it, it held the loyalties of, of that very impressive man. Now we're in the, the Donald Trump age. Um, um, is our order still as impressive? Do we still see the danger? I guess I think those things are probably related. Uh, you know, I think of Huey Long, who was probably the, um, the, the clearest case of an unambiguous demagogue mm -hmm. we've had, and the danger, at least outside of Louisiana, was recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, FDR called him one of the two most dangerous men in America. Um, man who recently reminded me the other being Douglas MacArthur. Mm -hmm. um, American Caesar. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the current attraction to <coughs> Donald Trump, um, whatever he thinks when he looks in the mirror, there, there, there's some way he feels more like a figure out of Tacitus uh, than out of a, a healthy republic. I mean, some Tacitus, of course, a book about not a republican order, but about the one Caesar founded. So, um, if we're in some danger of falling under the sway of a man like Trump, who I'm not <coughs> saying would make himself tyrant, but, but it's not somehow quite inconceivable, will we still hold the loyalty of, of whatever future men of really great ambition like Lincoln we might have? This is, this is an excellent question. Uh, and uh, I'm also, at the moment, I'm doing a little work for uh, 
the RAND Corporation uh, under the auspices of the Office of Net Assessment in the Pentagon, which is looking at uh, the United States and the future of global order. And uh, I mention this because uh, um, because it seems to me that, um, that there's a pretty decent evidence that a 35-year period of increasing liberalization of international politics, international order, uh, has uh, come to a close. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the direction international politics is moving anymore. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a, there's a whole crack up. But, but, but what do you do in response to this? Um, well, I mean, I think you have to remount a case uh, for uh, liberal order. Uh, and I, what I'm saying about international politics, I would say for the same in domestic politics. I don't think uh, in the event um, uh, uh, President Trump um, uh, attempts to um, uh, assert dictatorial uh, uh, privileges uh, to impute them to the office of the, of the presidency. Uh, you know, I expect there to be significant resistance to that from within our system. It'll be congressional. Uh, it's, it'll certainly be in the courts. It will be in public opinion. Um, it, the, you know, we, uh, the, and, and it will have a uh, particular character, which is to say it will be a product of our constitutional tradition, of our liberal tradition, uh, it, which is to say that will be the standard, that will be a standard that a number of people apply to him. Now, uh, can he, uh, you know, would he want to, but could he, would he have the power to extinguish that spirit? Which is to say, and another way of saying that would, uh, to say that globally would be, could you actually toss out liberal order effectively and permanently now? Um, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we're entering a period where that proposition will be tested more seriously than it has been over the past generation. It's been a very, very, very <laughs> benevolent period in the history of international politics. We are blessed, um, uh, but uh, the, uh, but, but, but I, I think that um, that when that, that even when things go badly, what we will not what we will say is well, so much for liberalism, that didn't work. Let's try something new. Um, I, I, I don't think that's the, that, that, that's the direction that, that the critique takes. I think it's, it'll, you know, it'll be more along the lines of an effort to, uh, uh, you know, for a restoration of, uh, uh, of liberal order. And you know, on, on, on the Lincoln case, I, well, I mean, he, he, did, he did trample the habeas corpus stuff and, uh, uh, and such. And, uh, and you know he he did so out of what he perceived to be necessity. I mean, there are people who I'm not a scholar of this of, of either this period, but I mean, but people note that uh, that you know in in times of crisis, um, the uh, you know we have had instances, uh, including some very severely uh, 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 damaging ones, uh, like uh, Japanese internment during the Second World War, um, that we have you know subsequently lived to regret in a big way. Uh, and to apologize for and offer compensation for and to say, well, we'll try never to do that again. And, you know, uh, so, I mean, I, I think that there is, uh, that there is substantial resilience uh, in liberal order. And, and in fact, you know, one of the things that, one of the reasons that I wrote this book, I mean, I suppose if it's got a sort of, a, uh, uh, if it's got a secret agenda, it's not even that much of a secret, it's to, you know, make a, to try to make a sustained case uh, for that resilience uh, and explain where it's come from, uh, where it's come from, where it, what its sources of strength are, and why, frankly, the people who have been so uh, quick uh, to dismiss, dismiss it, including some of the great minds of, uh, of, of the past couple centuries, have been off target, uh, not, not making nonsensical critiques, but crit offering critiques that, uh, that uh, responded to elements of, uh, to, to some of the weaker, weak elements, elements of deficiency in, uh, in liberal politics, but, but maybe not to all of them, and, and maybe uh, having not fully appreciated uh, some of the, uh, some, some aspects of, uh, of liberal political order. Here's a kind of theoretical question. Uh -oh. Uh, no, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, what's the relationship between greatness and goodness? There's, there's yeah. Greatness seems to be above goodness, yes. uh, beyond the call of duty. Mm -hmm. and, but on the other hand, uh, the, your title, The Politics of, uh, of Heroism, implies that uh, 
there was something doubtful about the goodness of of heroism. Yeah, uh, you know the the formal definition that I offer in the book of uh, of, 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 of a hero uh, is uh, someone uh, who is uh, uh, willing to um, risk death. Uh, out of a sense of fealty to an inner sense of greatness. Um, now, that's a formal definition, uh, which means that it would apply to Osama bin Laden in its formality. Now, what's the problem there? Well, the problem is we need content. Uh, and I think that specifically the content is this vision of the good that is this um, uh, that, that, entail, that, that, that is reflected in uh, modern uh, egalitarian democratic society. Uh, it is a um, sense of, uh, uh, of, the, of the good that, uh, that, that does not uh, uh, privilege uh, superiority uh, uh, of an individual uh, over others in the, in the, in the, in the political sense. Uh, it does not arrogate to itself a right to impose um, uh, a vision, um, such as uh, the Bin Laden vision. Um, and so I, 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 one, one must face up to the, to the reality, I think, that, that, that Bin Laden is, in, that, is, is in, that, in this formal sense heroic, and he's got the followers to prove it had. Um, but, uh, but we are not, um, this also goes to the, to the problem that, we were, that I was discussing a little bit in relation to whether you were on Alexander's side or not. You know, that's not a problem. That's not really much of an issue for us because, well, you know, we, 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 we're, we, we're all on Alexander's side now. But, you know, there's a, I've talked a little bit about um, uh, Tamerlan, Timur, uh, and uh, Toktamish. Uh, Toktamish was the, uh, I guess, I, oh, I'd have to go read my book, but uh, <laughs> the Khan of the Golden Horde who reunited the Horde and, uh, uh, and then was subsequently defeated by uh, Tamerlan. But if it had gone the other way, I mean, if Toktamish had been the one who defeated, we'd say the same things about Toktamish that we now say about Tamerlan. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, we, we, we've lost whatever you know, connection to that, to, to that as a living history that would, would, that, would, that would make us have a side. And so that's when it becomes possible, I think, to isolate the formal qualities of hero heroism. But when you get down to cases and you have to ask yourself, well, I mean, Hitler, uh, he was uh, certainly, uh, uh, willing to risk everything uh, in pursuit of a, an order in which he was uh, uh, the Führer, uh, well, then you have to add, then you have to have content to the uh, to the idea. And then again, I, and, I, and by the way, as I said, I mean, I I, I, I think that's uh, that's where the that's where the, the utility of the term villain uh, really comes to the fore. Yes, Carly. So would you say then that there is sort of a tension of some kind at the heart of what it is to be a hero? Because you seem very willing in a very sensible way um, that, make, again, it makes sense to me to say, uh, to us, the firefighters who ran into the Twin Towers are heroes. Uh, to others, Bin Laden's the hero, or the people who flew the planes in mm -hmm. to the Twin Towers are the hero. But at the same time, don't all of these people who were actually making the sacrifices themselves see themselves as acting in the way they're acting because of some sort of trans-political devotion of some kind, whether it's friendship, right, or what's right in a more permanent sense or just. Um, so on the one hand, it seems very regime-specific or very um, uh, contingent. But then the heroism, the heroic acts themselves seem to be devoted to something that transcends those. So how do those go together, you think? So you or is it just attention? I mean, I think I could go with tension just as a kind of cop out for what, what is really a very interesting question. Um, so yeah, so, you're, so the question would be how political is the, is, the, is the act, even when it seems to have political meaning? Or is, is it coming from? I, well, I think you know, uh, it's it's not that um, uh, it's not that Bin Laden op operates with no um, vision of the good. No, exactly. No, I'm saying he has he, he has precisely has one, that. But uh, it's just not ours. And yes, I am privileging ours, and I'm saying ours is right, and I'm prepared to defend that claim uh, against uh, uh, arguments to the contrary. Uh, but it's. Um, 
uh, but it's going to be contested. And, um, and, and, and in that sense, um, you're, you're, you're right to say that there are different visions of the good that animate. Uh, and, you know, uh, and, and so, so then is there something, you know, what, uh, a, a, way to fo a good way to focus this question would be to say, well, you know, what are the, uh, what are the bin Laden supporters think of the 9-11 firefighters who rushed into the building? I don't know. Maybe if you take the, if you take, if you make that canvas bigger, uh, all of a sudden, what looks like a consensus within the framework of this uh, liberal uh, society uh, is not a consensus. Maybe they, maybe there's a view that you know they were traitors, they were enemies of the state. I, you know, to be to, to be candid, there's a there's a, now a conspicuous uh, dissenter on the question of the heroism of 9/11 firefighters. Uh, Tanahisi Coates in his book uh, says he was, uh, you know, he he, did, he didn't see anything especially attractive there. This was a uh, this was the sort of these are the sort of characters who, you know, terrified him in, in his neighborhood uh, when he was uh, when he was growing up. So I mean, uh, uh, it, uh, it's it's a very good question. Does the professional duty of the of the um, uh, firemen and police in the, in 9/11 does that subtract from their heroism? Uh, if, if heroism means beyond the call of duty, in a way. These people, uh, they call themselves first responders. Right. So uh, the, <laughs> why, why, weren't well, they just doing their job? Well, that's what they say, if you ask them. Uh, yeah. I was just doing my job. I mean, this is what we train to do. That's all we do. I, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. um, in the first place, um, you know, you don't actually have to um, uh, commit suicide in order to fill your responsibilities uh, as a first responder. Um, there are always there, you know, lifeguards have a responsibility to try to pull you out. They do. That, that's part of the job. Um, if they stand idly by and make no effort, they will be culpable for that. Um, but uh, they also don't have to die trying in order to get you out. Um, if the circumstances are too dangerous to attempt a rescue, uh, there's, uh, it, is, it is not required. So that's that's point, the first point I'd raise. Second point would be, well, you know, you've, uh, you may have, a, uh, why do people become firefighters? I mean, why do they, uh, why do they go into this line of work? I mean, I, I suppose some of them just are continuing the family tradition. You know, it's a living, um, it's, you know, gets you, gets you out of the, uh, out of the house. It's uh, not a, not a desk job, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, and here's the but, um, you know, it's also not a line of work that is necessarily uh, conducive to a relatively assured conviction that you're going to make it home that night. Uh, there's a greater degree of risk that is intrinsic to the selection of the occupation. The same is true of joining the military. By the way, there was uh, for a long period of time, a great deal of skepticism, elite skepticism, about the ability of the U.S. military to sustain itself as a fighting force in the event that a war came along. The thought was, well, I mean, sure, people will sign up for, uh, uh, for the job in peacetime, and they need, it, they need the jobs, they want the college benefits, they want all the rest of it, but, you know, when a war comes along, and, you know, I, I think that, uh, uh, I think that recent experience has indicated that there is a, uh, significant uh, and capable uh, segment of the U.S. population uh, that is willing to uh, uh, sign up uh, in full expectation of being deployed uh, someplace dangerous. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's, you know, that's an indicator of a, of a type of, uh, uh, of a type of, of, a, of an individual. And, you know, we might call it, you, you, you might call it spiritedness. Uh, you, uh, yeah. Um, which I think is, uh, is, is a live quality uh, in the world today and expresses itself in, 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 the, in some of these kinds of, uh, of, the, of decisions. 